Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the Swarm Chatter podcast. On this episode of the podcast, I'm going to be joined by Sammy Oziel, who is the executive director of On the Derech, which in which he publishes various uh, sidurim, sidurim, according to the Moroccan uh, Nusach, um, Hebrew with English translation. Actually, there's some also just with the Hebrew, and we'll be discussing that. There's uh, Right now, he has um, sidurim. There's Yom Kippur, Machzer, there's Slichas, there's Tisha B'Av, Siddur with Kinnah. So we'll be discussing all those and what exactly he's been doing. So thank you for joining me. Thank you, Nafi. Nice to be here. So t- let's start off. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah, sure. So um, I'm born and raised in Toronto. I now live in Israel. But um, uh, my family uh, came from Tangiers, Morocco, which is uh, in the north. It's a northern uh uh, international port city in 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 uh, Morocco. Um, they, you know, my grandfather um, and his brothers, uh, my grandfather is uh, whose name I carry. And my name is Samuel Ozil. That was his name as well. I have several cousins with the same name. If if anybody's familiar with how how that works, um, uh, you know, uh, so so uh, they uh, they came from Tangiers uh, to Toronto in the. Uh, in the late 50s, early 60s, and um, they established the, uh, a Moroccan Sephardic synagogue in Toronto called Petah Tikva, and uh, that's basically where I was raised. Um, is, what's interesting about Toronto is that, you know, the the uh, pretty much most of the of the town of the city of Tangiers, the the Jewish community there, uh, joined, and you know moved to Toronto as well. So the uh, the Sephardic breakdown in the city of Toronto is very unique. It's almost entirely Spanish Moroccan um, community with uh, one one synagogue uh, that is uh, is uh, you know French Moroccan customs, but uh, there's really no other types of Sephardim there, uh, at least not in on a community level. Um, so my family um, is a big family. The Ozil family is, you know, big, beautiful family. I was raised uh, um, with, uh, you know, many, many cousins, and we all spent Shabbats together, and very uh, focused on family and and, and Judaism. And um, and then um, uh, in my twenties, uh, I, uh, you know, sort of went off on my own, came to Israel, um, sort of became like a like a Baltishuva in a sense because I was like traditional but wasn't really uh it wasn't really uh from and uh and then um you know decided i wanted to to make my life in israel and and uh and came in aliyah in my in my mid late 20s so how did you become interested in sidurim and nusach atfilo and various menhagim as you already alluded to you mentioned spanish moroccan french moroccan and for those that aren't familiar yeah. with the nitty-gritty concepts we'll discuss that in a little bit but how did you become interested generally in this that you ended up starting to publish now various sidurim and right. things right so so um you know it really all starts with my grandfather um who i mentioned before uh, when when the family and the community relocated to toronto um there wasn't really any sidur that um, followed the uh, the Spanish Moroccan nusach um, accurately. So they were using a whole bunch of different sidurim. They had a lot of loose leaf papers and photocopies and stuff. So in the early seventies, my grandfather took it upon himself to uh, to make a sidur for the community that followed the nusach precisely. Um, this uh, sidur was called siach tefila. He also made four other, uh, four other books, four other, uh, three other machzorim um, for the uh, um, for the rest of the holidays, and um, and uh, he took it took about you know fifteen twenty years or so for him to to put it all together, and until recently, you know the the community had been using those sidurim exclusively, so um, when I made my way to Israel and became much more relig- much more religious or much more interested in in uh, in Judaism um you know I was in yeshiva in Israel and um you know no one really knew anything about my grandfather Sidur, but they were you know they're based on um you know my, my grandfather literally was doing copy paste I mean he was photocopying other books and putting it all together so it's it's not really in terms of 
quality of, you know, wasn't up there with like what you would find with the art scroll, right? So I see the art scroll, it's got translation, it's got English instruction, it's got a commentary, a running commentary. And then, you know, Corin's got something very similar, you know, incredible, incredible works um, that, uh, that, that the Ashkenazim have had for, for, for decades. And I was asking around, well, where's the, you know, where's the Moroccan version of this? Where can I find a Sidur like this? And people were looking at me like, you know, shrugging their shoulders. And I don't know, you know, um, some people directed me to a Sidur called Orot, uh, Sephardic Sidur, but it's a Syrian Sidur. And um, so at some point it was, you know, sort of like the Makom Sheinish. Well, this doesn't exist. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who'd be interested in it. So I took it upon myself to do the research on what it would take to make a Sidur, like the art scroll, like the corn, um, with all those all those different aspects. And um, and that's how we got, really got started. Um, you know, I came I came back to my my hometown in Toronto, telling people about what I wanted to do. Of course, they were very familiar with the work that my grandfather did, and um, you know that got a lot of support from people there, and I was able to raise some money and. And um, and then I was off uh, doing this. It was all passion project. It was all stuff I was doing on the side. Okay, so obviously there's there's a lot more to to follow up there on about what you know how you started this and what the process has been like and who's been doing the work, etc. But I think we'll leave those at the end. Let Let's get, start off talking now. Mm-hmm. You mentioned how you know the Ashkenazim are very siddur, and people probably think, "What do you mean? Art school just published a Sfardi siddur? What are you talking about?" Mm-hmm. Art and that really gets back to I think. Ashkenazim, especially Ashkenazim, essentially thinking that Sardim are Sfardim, right? And and they're all the same, and they have a you know a non Ashkenaz or Sfard, meaning like you know Hasidic non Nusach. It's, it's all right. the same, you know. You do some sort of funny, you know, noises in shul, and different things are going on. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, it's that's not accurate. That's not exactly what's going on. There's there are differences in the various you know different Nusach that everyone's having Nuschalot, and so we really have to start there. Let, let's start of generally. When, when, you know, especially for listeners that are Ashkenazic or I'm sure there's Friday also, but just in general overview of when we talk about Edut Mizrach, and so it's basically Eastern Sephardim versus Western Sephardim. When you have the Eastern Sephardim, everyone's probably familiar with the Syrian and you have Persian and Egyptian mm-hmm. and whatever the whole part of the world. And you have the the Western Sephardim where you'll have the Tunisian and the Moroccan, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, talk about that, um, what the differences are between them. And the, the basic differences before we dive into the Moroccan specific differences. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I, I would start with talking about the Ashkenazim for a minute because I th- I have a theory, and I'm not sure it's this is you know exactly accurate, but um, I have a theory that that there were a lot of different nuschot within the Ashkenazim. I know there were several um, in Europe, um, but you know, after being decimated by the Holocaust, I think a lot was lost. And then when the Ashkenazi community really regathered itself, um, you know, it, it was really amalgamated into sort of one Nusach called Ashkenaz, um, which I think the art scroll actually had a lot to do with. And then and then um, you have obviously Nusach Sfart, but but it really became these just two basic um, you know, two basic Nusachot for for the Ashkenaz, whereas the Sfartim. Um, Sort of always maintained the, their their particular brand of of uh, tefillah wherever they were living. So you have um, you have the Eastern Sephardim, um, Syria, um, Egypt, um, you know Lebanon, um, uh, Iraq, Iran, and and those Sephardim um, go under one general banner called Eduta Mizrach. Uh, Still within those communities, you have differences. You know, there's there's differences between the Syrian way of praying and the Persian. But generally speaking, it's 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 almost you know very similar to each other. And, and that that umbrella is Aduta Mizrach. Then you have the Western Sephardim uh, that go under the umbrella term Kahal Kadosh, which and there you're talking about the Moroccans, Tunisian, Algerians, um, Spanish, Portuguese, and and there you also have differences in Tfila. From one country to the next, and even within those countries, you have differences. You know, you talk to some people who will tell you who who, who lived in those countries, and they'll tell you, you know, it different it differed from city to city, and even within a city, it differed on which side of the city you were on, right? It, it, it depended, you know, if you were in the north part, the shuls there did it one way. You know, some people say, you know, if you cross the street, the different the shul on the other side of the street says something different. So those those um. Uh, the prayers that were that were maintained in those places um, 
uh, never got interrupted like they did by the Ashkenazim. And then when a lot of these communities relocated, you know, a lot of the Syrians relocated to New York, um, et cetera. So um, the Spartan were, you know, very good at maintaining their their Nusach and bringing it over to wherever they, they reestablished themselves and keeping it the way it was. Um, the Moroccans that, that I'm, you know, the family that I come from, the community I come from, um, super stubborn about keeping every little last um, custom that they had. So, um, you know, and, and, and there's no talk about even changing one iota of the mean hug. So, um, it, it's it's kind of common within the Spartan in general to be to be very loyal to the way it was done. You know, the 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 darche avot um, is is a big deal, and so um, you have with the Spartan all those different nusraot maintained um, from different countries, different cities, etc. So, obviously, yeah, you are correct with the Ashkenazic um, davening that attitude community being decimated. There are differences, and I'm thinking of—I remember a couple of years ago, somebody I was kind of like someone in uh, Dutch. They put out a new Dutch Ashkenazi sitter there, and you had different nuschas in Germany and Ashkenaz, and you know, in Poland and Lita, of course, and that all kind of got like mixed together. And like you're saying, you know, we'll leave that for a different podcast. There is what to talk mm. about there for sure about Nusra Ashkenaz and Sfarad, and then you also have Chabad doing Tfil Sari. Right, there's different. There are, you know, variation of success. So there are there are differences, but we'll leave that. But now, before I get to Morocco, I want to. So you mentioned the Kal Kadosh versus Edut Mizrach. Are there any like differences that you can think of examples to point out? Like, what would be a difference that comes to mind between the two that you could give as to the listener? Sure. Yeah, I, I'd say one of the main differences is that the Edut Mizrach is much more influenced by Kabbalah. Um, I mean, when you look at the um, what was you know what was going on in Sfat in the 16th century and how the Arizal um, had had uh, sort of uh, uh, renewed the idea of Kabbalah uh, in a way that that um, you know hadn't really been recognized before and all of a sudden it spread all over the world it was really uh, absorbed um, and accepted among the Dutmi's Rach communities and implemented into their tefillah. Um, the Western Sephardim were not as uh, macabre to to the Kabbalah um, and those differences in changing their their way of prayer. Uh, that's one major difference, uh, and that and, and that's a, that's a blanket uh, you know statement about you know there are going to be different communities that accepted different things and and so it's not saying that it wasn't accepted at all, but to a lesser extent. Okay, so now now let's talk about the Moroccan. Um, as you mentioned, you called them the French and Spanish Moroccan. You can talk about where that comes from. There's also the term mm-hmm. the Qurashim and the Toshavim, um, the ones that were in Morocco, essentially Toshavim and Mugurashim. Mm-hmm. Listeners may be familiar with mm-hmm. the series on Spain, the ones that could come down to Morocco after the Gerush Sfarad, after the expulsion. Mm-hmm. But you can talk about those different terminologies and what that means and just the general overview of the different communities that kind of is going to lead to these differences in Nusra Khatfila. Yeah, so the um, so I, I refer to it as Spanish Moroccan or French Moroccan because the 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 mother tongue for for these two different groups of Moroccans was you know uh, the majority and you know, what's often referred to as sort of like standard Moroccan or people talk about Moroccans are generally talking about the French Moroccans. Um, these you know I I also would say that the the Spanish Moroccans are often maybe just not if you take language out of it were based mostly in the north. So when they first came down, um, they they were they were mainly um, you know s- stationed in Fez and Meknes. Um, but um, before leaving Morocco, the, the main uh, communities uh, of of this group of uh, of Magurashim were in Tangiers and Tetuan and a lot of the little cities up there in the north of Morocco. Um, overall, I would say this is still you know. Maybe ten to fifteen percent of the, of the Moroccans in general. If you're looking at it from like what is the percentage difference, um, so a significant minority, but um, but still, um, you know, there was there was uh, a lot of communities up there in the north of Morocco. Um, the differences from a tefillah standpoint, um, you know, I would say you have to go back to. The understanding, you know, the the Nusach Livorno, um, which is that when 
when the printing press came out um, in in Leghorn, Italy, they had a printing press there, and they sent books to be to be um, published and and mass produced in Leghorn, Italy, and um, it was referred to as Livorno. And when those books came back, it became known as Nusach Livorno. And this became like a standard sidur in Morocco. Um, uh, the the names of the sidur there's two sidurim that that are mainly referred to as Nusach Livorno, which is Tafilat Chodesh. And um, uh, oh, it's slipping my mind now. Um, the other one. Um, okay. So, anyways, uh, the, oh, sorry, the Beethoven. The Beethoven is the other one. Um, so that that became that can became pretty well accepted throughout Morocco in in the French Moroccan uh, communities, which is most of Morocco. In the Spanish Moroccan communities, they they didn't they didn't really accept it, the, those sidurim into their communities. They had their own way of praying. It was still very similar, right? We're not talking about major differences here. Um, we're talking about small differences, but but still there are there are differences, and, and those sidurim did not um, did not pervade those communities. So you mentioned Livorno, Leghorn, Italy. That was even though it was in Italy, and Italy is a kind of a mix of different minhagim. But that was a Sephardi mm-hmm. city exclusively, Spanish Portuguese. A lot of Sephardim, and there was a printing press, a lot of Sephardi things. You mentioned the Seder Bet Oved, Bet Menucha of uh, Yehuda Shmuel Ashkenazi, mm-hmm. I believe that was the 19th century. That Seder, so there's a new edition recently done by Avat Shalom. I know they did some changes and tweaks here and there. I don't know, some people were happy, not happy about whatever. That's for a different episode to discuss that. Mm-hmm. Seder. There's a lot of halachas there. It's a, it's a, yeah, you can, you can get the two volumes set now and a nice new print. It's redone, whatever. Um, now, just um, before we get dive more into the differences in Nusach, um, amongst the two, you, as you you know, we'll go with your as you're referring to them, French versus Spanish Moroccan. What about the actual communities? As you mentioned, in the north, you kind of had where is where you had the Spanish Moroccan, and the, kind of in the south, I don't think you mentioned any. Like, what are the main cities of where you would see the French Moroccans? And were there like differences between the two? Did they quote unquote intermarry? Did they do things together? Did mm-hmm. they were they like separate communities besides for Nusachatvila? Before we get to that, right? Um, so. Um, yeah, I mean the the big tourist centers for um, for the French Moroccans. I would say, um, I mean the main one I think is Marrakesh, and 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 the the big thing about Marrakesh is that you you in the southern the more southern um, the city was in uh, in Morocco, uh, it seems to me that the more uh, the more accepting they were of Kabbalistic influence into the tefillah. Um, you you know you had the Bukhutzer family that was that was in that area and and obviously they were um, they were the champions of of, uh, of 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 implementing Kabbalah and um, within Morocco in general and so um, you you have you have that the, the sort of the Marrakesh Nusach and then you have as you go up north it sort of changes um, the in terms of uh, how they were different. Um, you know, in terms of just the the, the customs and and the people, um, I think the French Moroccans were a little bit more integrated into the Arabic culture there. Um, I know that growing up, we did not speak Arabic. Uh, there's even Arabic in some of the tefillah that the the French Moroccans do. You, you know, the Spanish Moroccans didn't do any of that. Um, so you had, and it's just not just the tefillah, but also. Um, it, Culturally, um, they, they, you know, they spoke Arabic and and they were more and they I mean, they spoke French as well. So um, the Spanish Moroccans kept their Spanish language and Spanish culture. And you know, my father's mother tongue is Spanish. So uh, there is also a little bit of a difference in the way that the Spanish Moroccans sort of thought of themselves as being like. I would say, and I'm going to get myself in trouble here, maybe a little bit, but they they thought themselves as as more of like a higher class type of you know people. You know, they were they you know, put their nose a little bit in the air. Um, you know, it was like, oh, you know, we don't integrate with the French Moroccans, right? We we they called them foresteros, which which means foreigners, even though it's kind of funny because they were the ones there before, and the Spanish Moroccans the ones that that were foreign. Um, but there's there's sort of a pejorative, um, you know way that they look at that i mean it's i don't i think it's pretty antiquated i don't think anybody really thinks of it like that anymore but there is that sort of thing it's i would say it's somewhat similar to if you look at syrian jewelry and you look at the halabim right and the halabim the way they the way they feel like oh like halabim is different like we're not you know we're not the same as as the as as the other syrian jews it, it's it's a i would say it's it's uh 
there's there's something similar there in the way that the Spanish Moroccans would think about themselves. So your family then is Spanish Moroccan. Do you know? Does your family like trace themselves back? When did they show up in Morocco, and how long? Uh, yeah, I can't tell you. I know when my family did necessarily, but I can tell you that I I, I remember this something that stuck at, stood out in my mind. Well, I, I remember traveling, um, you know, on vacation, and we brought my 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 grandparents with us. And when we would meet people, and they would say, "Oh, where are you from?" And my grandmother was, you know, born born and raised in Morocco. She would say, "Oh, I'm from Spain." Right. She she was never from Spain. Right. But she spoke Spanish and she felt like she was a Spanish person. Right. That, that that's you know, that's what she believed she was like. They were basically forced to go to Morocco because they got kicked out of Spain. I mean, that happened hundreds of years before, but she still felt like she was a Spanish, a Spanish lady. Right. So um, I can't tell you the exact history, but I know that that is a that was a sort of a pervading mentality in, in my family and maybe with many others. That, that we're a Spanish people um, that were, you know, and, and also the north of Morocco, you can basically see Spain from there. So it's like, you know, the Straits of Gibraltar, it's like you can swim there. Yeah. And, and you know, as you mentioned, there was kind of that difference in the community. I think in the, the Chuvas, after the expulsion, you see that there's some questions. There was always, you know, the community's integrating or not. There's always some some things about that. So let's now jump back to Nusach, which we were discussing. So you mentioned Livorno Nusach, you mentioned the Sidurim from Livorno. And so mm-hmm. the kind of impact they had in Morocco and the Moroccan Minhag. So Moroccan Minhag and, and, and standard Nusukh. So you get into this, you're publishing, so you can talk about this and what you did in your Sidur, and we could kind of talk about now. Right. But what kind of is like the standard? You know, again, talking about Livorno, did you, did you use that as the basis? What did you use as the basis? And what, what kind of happened there and yeah. basic difference? I know there's a, a bunch of things to unpack, but let's right. Like so there's a lot going on in terms of the Nusukh, and, and sorting it out took, you know, like more than half a year just to, to do research on and to figure out. Um, yeah, it is based on Livorno, and and what I, what I set out to do from the beginning is to make a Moroccan sidur that incorporated both the customs of French Morocco and Spanish Morocco, um, which is also unique because you don't have anything like that um, out there. All the Moroccan sidurim you'll find on the market basically are just French Moroccan um, with differences uh, between them, but um, you don't have any of the Spanish Moroccan stuff in there generally. Um, so I wanted to make something that was all encompassing Moroccan. And I did base it on Livorno, but uh, what I what I was more focused on and loyal to, you could say, is the modern Moroccan sidurim. Um, so I took uh, a, about a dozen Moroccan sidurim on the market today, um, or this is ten years ago, and I laid them out prayer by prayer, fila by fila, on an Excel an Excel file. And then I compared and contrast each one of them to see what are where are all the mahlukot, like what's the differences, right? Um, and and then I worked with uh, Rabbi Mordechai Lebhar and some other post game who really uh, know the the, the nusa, you know, inside and out. And um, and we sorted out. We sorted out what you know is 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 this a legitimate? You know, this is only in one of the sidurim, and the other eleven don't have it. Is it this? Is this um, paragraph or 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 tefila, uh, is it legitimate? Um, you know, so there in in the sidur you have that I made, you have a lot of yeshomrim. You have um, a lot of times you'll have you know uh, communities from, from you know people from this city say this, people from that city city say that. Um, a lot of some say, a lot of most say. Um, and we we really try to be all encompassing because you know these sidurim. You know, some of them are more tailored towards what was going on in Marrakesh, and, and I say I would say the the, the more you know the, the the main difference, or at least the uh, most recognizable difference between, um, let's say, uh, um, you know, some of the the new stuff you'll find in the, in the Sidurim is um, in the Amida itself, in the fourth uh, bracha. You know, the there is Dea um, Bina Veskel. And then there's Chochma Bina Vadat. So Chochma Bina Vadat, um, you'll find that in if you see that in the Sidur, in the Amida, then you know that this is a Sidur that is more Kabbalistically influenced. Um, if you see Dea Bina Vaskel, that's more the original uh, Moroccan Nusach that, um, that is certainly what you're going to find in, in the in Spanish Moroccan um, you know, communities. Um, but there's also other differences. I mean, you know, we, I can jump into each one of them individually, but um, you know, parsing it all out and then putting it all back together into one book without making it 
too difficult to use, right? Because user friendliness was was also a big um, uh, uh, priority of ours. We didn't want to make it too complicated where it would be impossible to be a, a functional book, a functional CDUR. So it was a challenge that that uh, took a long time to sort out, but I think we did uh, we did a good job of it. Yeah, so I mean, talk about more differences and how you did that, and, and exactly how the Sudurim, except for Yom Kippur, which we can talk about how you published two different ones. You kind of separated mm-hmm. the, the different the different nuschas um, between French and Spanish. The, all the other books that you printed, the Sudurim, the Slichas, the Kinnis are both together. So what you know, you mentioned what that process was like. But what are like some differences, and how do you practically if one's using the the Sidur, How do they see it? How does that right? How does it yeah. So some some things are easy. For example, you know the more Kabbalistically influenced Sidorim, um, they have L'Shem Yichud before like every prayer, right? Um, whereas um, a lot of the non-Kabbalistically influenced communities didn't say that. So for the most part. So you'll, you know, I'll have L'Shem Yichud in there and it'll say some say. And if you say it, you say it. If you don't say it, skip it. Um, you know, that's sort of like the, the the mentality that I had going into the whole thing is like try to be as inclusive as possible. And if if it's not, you know, if you're if you're praying out of this book and you don't say that thing, then you can skip it. Um, one of the one of the ones that I, I know that I get a lot of uh, a lot of comments about uh, is putting kaveh and enkeloheinu in arvit. Um, so uh, the Spanish Moroccans, um, and I, I believe that the the origination of this is that um, their custom is that when you're saying uh, kaddish. Um, for for a loved one um, passed away, then you, you you would do it. You know, if, if there's uh, let's say four or five sons, they only do it one son at a time. You can't. You don't. All all sons don't stand up and say kaddish at the same time. So if you're only saying one and one of them is saying it at a time, so then you want to give them more opportunities. There's many sons to say it. You want to give them more opportunities. So um, they. I think this is the origination of it. You have in our Arvit, um, right after um, Shilam Ma'alot, um, all Sephardim, uh, you know, Dut Mizrach and uh, the rest of Morocco, what they say is they do Kaddish and then they do they do Baruchu and, and Aleinu, right? The Spanish Moroccans do Baruchu and then they do Kaveh and then Kelohenu and then do another Kaddish, right? So, so I put that in the Sidur and it kind of drives the French Moroccans crazy. I mean, they they uh, they get very annoyed by it for some reason. And I always say to them, "Look, if you don't say it, I know you don't say it. Just skip it. Just flip the page, and then you're you haven't lost anything. You're exactly where you need to be in the tefillah." But the Spanish Moroccans do say it, uh, so it has to be there, right? Because that's that's the that's the idea of the book is that it's going to be inclusive for both. So. Um, uh, that that's one thing that is, is without fail I'll get a comment about that. And I even had people approach me and say, "Can we make another version of the Sidur and just take out Kavan and Kolhenu?" <laughs> Which I find to be amusing. It's like you're going to make a whole new book just take out one prayer. Okay. <laughs> and and to be clear for those not familiar, so you after Shmona Esrei, after you finish my reviews, to this Kaddish and then Shilamalas, then Kaddish, then Kaveh. That's what you're talking about. Then Kaddish, it's like more different than what Ashkenazim are familiar. Just Alenu. Yeah. No, yeah. Away. After Amida. You know, <clears throat> in our beat, um, you have Hadish Tit Kabal, and then um, and then you have Shir Lamalot, which is different. The Sfardim all do that. Um, the uh, Ashkenazim don't. And then you then you would have a um, you know another Kaddish, and then usually it's just you know Baruchu and Aleinu. And here we're saying Baruchu and then Kaveh and Kelohenu and then another Kaddish Kaddish Al Yisrael and then Aleinu. Okay, yeah. So if you have other practical differences, you know, you can you can give other examples. I'll, I'll just mention some other things about the Siddur we can also discuss. So you can you can work in some examples after this, which is um, it, so the Siddur itself, you have one just Hebrew and one, you know, all the uh, let me start the other way. All the volumes that you've printed are Hebrew with English on the corresponding page, kind of like the art scroll, the classic, the Hebrew and English, except one Siddur is just all Hebrew with the laws and customs and the commentary is in English. You just removed kind of the translation for those that don't need that. So there is a commentary, Siach Tfilah, on the bottom. You can talk about the commentary. And then there's also laws and customs. I'm looking at 
I'm pulling out of the Chazar Sashats. You have for Forsh Manesh, you have a couple of pages of laws and customs. Um, you also have just like general information inside of the you know, inside of the Siddur, the English yeah. can take three steps back, you know, in just as one line, right. you have those kind of instructions in English mm-hmm. throughout the text. Right. So, um, you know, in terms of the laws and customs, I put these laws and customs sections um, within, like inside the, the prayers before the prayers start. You know, I know a lot of Siddurim, I think Art Scroll does it this way, where they put laws and customs all in the back. And I always felt like, Chaval, you know, who's going to go to the back and check out the Halachot? So better that if you're about to pray Amida, you have the laws and customs section right there. Now, it's obviously not a full, you know, halachic puntress on everything you need to know about Amida. But um, I, I tried to work with, you know, um, with the post game to sort of limit it to the tefillah that you would have to know. You know the, the basic idea is that um, this sidur should be easy to follow for someone who's not so familiar with tefillah, but also... On a certain level, you know, the commentary um, is, is, you know, can be low level and high level. Um, so the lecha can be very basic. And, and as you mentioned, um, I, I included many different visual aids for when to bow, um, when to lift up. And I was out, you know, when to raise your voice, when to lower your voice. Um, in the art scroll, you know, for example, they, they, they just write it in English. And it becomes a little bit challenging to, to read a little tiny little English thing in the middle of a prayer. Um, and, and and I was a victim of this myself. I remember I used to, you know, I used to bow for Modim and then I would get up right away and people were like, someone told me, no, you, you have to wait till you say Hashem's name and then you you lift up, you lift up before Hashem's name. Um, and I, I didn't know that. And I was like, well, it's not written anywhere. Like, you know, well, there's a lot of these things that like, it's not written anywhere, but you just know, you know, you just know how to do it because, you know, you know, if you're, it, it's, it's a, it, it's like an oral tradition. Um, so I was like, well, if if someone is is a, is new to prayer or you know is not so familiar, um, wouldn't wouldn't it be advantageous for this to be in the siddur itself? Um, so, you know, we we decided to put in visual cues to do it, just like you'd be in a car and you have all different types of of uh, of images that tell you know like you know it's the same sort of thing. You know, you don't have buttons where where it's all words written on it you can have just images and you know like this is a hazard button um because you see the triangle it's the same sort of idea yeah my is a very nice example where you have kind of that you have like a little gray down arrow right before the word my mm-hmm. and then the arrow goes up it's shot to who and then the arrow's up and then you have a shem so mm-hmm. knowing exactly say people don't realize it just no. if, you, if you wouldn't know then you wouldn't know if you don't know the Allah. so that's mm-hmm. something that you have in there which is very nice um um, as you pointed out, yes, you have the laws and custom section in the, in, inside the, the text. Um, I, I don't know if you mentioned just because, like, what um, the laws and customs for a second. Where did you get those from? How are those written? How are those compiled? What were those based on? Right. So it it was important for me to know what I know and what I don't know. And for the things I don't know, which is a lot, because I myself feel like a Balchuva and and uh, I took a very academic approach to to making to making this project to making these sidurim, where you know I did a lot of research and then I would um, hire uh, contractors. I would I would you know contract out to to um, to rabbinic uh, experts, rabbinic authorities, especially ones who are known for for you know having an expertise in this particular field. Um, so when it came to halacha, I, you know, I had different rabbanim that um, would write it for me, or um, I would work with them on writing it, and 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 then we would, you know, try to make it as concise as possible because you know space uh, space in the sidur is uh, is uh, is a big deal, especially when you're talking about uh, you know writing halacha when this is not uh, supposed to be a halachic sefer. So um, we tried to make it just as uh, whatever was necessary for tefillah, um, we we put in. So, um, and I want to talk about that space in a second and what you, things that were left out. But before that, um, so the Siach Tefillah, the commentary, what was that based on? What kind of is the, you mentioned this a little bit, but what kind of, it's a little bit more, what's like the, I don't know if you have an example, like what are the things that you put in the commentary? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I named it uh, the commentary uh, Siach Tefillah because that was the name of my grandfather, Sidur. Um, so that, that's where the name originated from. But in terms of what the content uh, is about, um, it, it's, um, <clears throat> on a, on a, on a basic level, <clears throat> it's just, you know, questions that maybe you would think about like 
what Rashi was asking himself. You know, what what does this mean? What if there's a question that jumps out at you? You know, what is it and what's the answer? What is this prayer doing here? What is its meaning? Um, you know, why is it here as opposed to somewhere else? So some of the basic questions I'm trying to answer. And then you have um, more specifically um, the, the uh, there's information about, you know, where, what city it was set in or why they said it, what, where, where, the, where the custom came from. So when there's all, when there's information about, you know, the uniqueness of a minhag that came from a certain city or from a certain part of the country, in Morocco, you have information there about that in the commentary. Um, and sometimes you just have, um, you know, it, it, it would be, you know, I, I had people who would write certain um, um, commentaries or I would read a certain commentary that I thought was beautiful um, or, or see other you know commentaries and say, hey, how can we incorporate this idea into the tefillah? Because I think it, 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 you know, sheds a lot of light on the meaning of this prayer. And you talked about space and there are things that you took out or left out to, because of that, because you were trying to make a fully functional sitter, but have it not be a, you know, either very small font or unwieldy volume. So if you can talk about what was left out and what the decision was there, how you made those decisions. And also, I'll just mention something interesting you did a lot of times if you take an art scroll or any other you know, translated work, it'll have page 100 is the Hebrew and then 101 is the English or vice versa. In here, mm -hmm. again, looking at Maidim, you have, it says on that page 112 in the Hebrew, and the English is also page 112. So what was the decision to do that? They, they're, they're the same page number. You'll turn to that same, you know, double mm -hmm. fold. It's the same page. It's not different page number. Even though it's a different page, I guess, technically. Right. <clears throat> so um, the English uh, translation is a mirror image of the, of the Hebrew prayer, um, just in different language, right? So even the instructions are exactly the same, uh, and the footnotes are the same. So we put them as the same page number. And, and the, the theory behind that was really um, when we were making the Sidur, um, I wanted to leave the door open to be able to make a different edition of the Sidur that didn't include the translation, while at the same time keeping the pagination consistent, right? So um, what we did is, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, we, um, we finished a new edition of the Sidur called the Saruya edition, which took out the translation. Um, and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a smaller book. Um, we figured that there would be lots of, uh, you know, Moroccans who didn't necessarily feel like a translation um, benefited them, uh, that it made the book much bigger and more cumbersome or, or heavier and flipping more pages or whatever. So they would want something without a translation. And, and um, we wanted to make the pagination consistent so that you could use either book in a shul, right? If, I'm, if you're in a shul that has both editions of the book, the Amida first Mincha is on the exact same page in both books. And, and I think that, was, that would be beneficial. So that's why we have the, the same page number on both sides uh, of a two-page spread in the, uh, in the translated version, which is the Ben Murgi edition. Um, in terms of how we came up with the whole construction of, of the book and, and made the best use of space, we really did a lot of thinking on this. And, and we asked a lot of people what their preference was, right? Because there was ideas to maybe do a weekday version and a Shabbat version, and you'd have basically two different Sidurim. Um, and for the most part, people didn't want that. Um, but we were we had this challenge of, you know, well, what are we going to do? Because if you look at a regular Moroccan Sidur, uh, most of them are seven, eight, nine hundred pages, and we, we don't want to make a book that's you know fifteen hundred pages or more or whatever. So how do we how do we deal with all this content? Um, and basically, we got cornered into um, this idea of uh, not translating every single prayer. There are certain things that are not translated. I would say it's about it's less than ten percent. It's more like you know five percent of stuff is not translated, um, and then you have um, Feel out that word that you'll find in, in regular Sidurim, like um, life cycle events, um, Sefer Tehillim, um, uh, Pirkei Avot, um, all kinds of special prayers and, and blessings that you would say at certain times of the year or, or for certain things. So those, those prayers are all not included in the translated Sidur in the member of the edition. It's really just weekday tefillah, Shabbat tefillah, Rosh Chodesh, fast days. Parashiyot, um, with very little else in, included. And then the Suri edition, which has uh, no translation, 
um, we added back in all that content that was left out of the event murky edition. So all the life cycle events, Greet Me La, Pijona Ban, special prayers and 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 uh, and blessings and Yom Tov Amida, all that stuff that people would generally look to a book, which, which I call ancillary uh, content. Uh, it, has nothing to, it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the weekday and the Shabbat prayers, but you often find them in the Sidorim in the back quarter of a Sidor, back third of a Sidor. So that stuff is in the Sarivi edition, but it's not in the Ben Murky edition. Okay, I, I do want to mention, I, I forgot to mention, there's a user guide in the front, which gives the pronunciation A's and the visual A's. It does explain all the different interesting, like, like you mm-hmm. said, I think it's good. You probably like got a car or like, you know, you have street signs, you have those little, that's right. a good way of um, comparing them. So you have that in there. And let's talk a little bit about the, the you don't have Rosh Hashanah Machzor yet, but uh, you have a Yom Kippur Machzor, actually two, as we mentioned. That's the one where you kind of split the, the Nuschos. Mm-hmm. And you also have um, Slichas, which is something... That uh, Svartim, of course, say the entire L, you know, all the way from right. the beginning of the Scottish L until Yom Kippur. So, I don't know if you have some, like, how, what, to, to, just to talk a little bit, let's, let's talk a little bit about the Slichas right. and Yom Kippur Master and what, what is done in there and also how that, I don't know, I, I guess some examples, how that, of what you did, how that differs from stan, kind of standard, for Ashkenazi, standard Svartim, it does Mizrach, but again, how it differs from it does Mizrach, right. you know, et cetera. Right, right, right. Yeah, I often get. Uh, get that you know the standard and you guys are the are the non-standard it's like it's funny because when, when uh, growing up in this community in toronto it was like this is the only way i knew what sparty meant right so like i i knew what i thought ashkenazi was different but i was like oh this is sparty and then you i i, I go to israel and and everybody's like i've never even heard of that like we, we never even seen uh you should see the um if you want to take a look at something that's unique with by this by the Moroccans, you can look at the uh, at the Birkat Mazon, for example. We have all kinds of things there that that, that the Dut Mizrach doesn't doesn't have. So, uh, in terms of Yom Kippur, um, you know, from the beginning, really the the, the goal of, of 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 my organization of On the Derek was how do we you know what is the most important thing that the community needs in order to more effectively and more meaningfully pray to Kaddish Baruch Hu, right? So obviously to start with a Sidor. And then it was like, well, what would be the next the next project that would be, you know, um, the most important if we're prioritizing our time here? Uh, and, you know, it, it was obvious that Yom Kippur was the one day a year where, first of all, you have, you know, every Jew shows up for Yom Kippur, right? Uh, at least by the Moroccans, like everybody, even if you're not coming to shul during the week or even on Shabbat, you're coming in Yom Kippur. So you have a lot of people who are not so familiar with prayer. They're going to open up a Yom Kippur Machzor. It's going to be all in Hebrew. They're not going to know what they're saying. And this is the one day a year where essentially you're pleading for your life, right? You're, <laughs> and if you don't understand what you're saying, then what are you doing, there, right? Um, and and I, I, I myself struggle with that. That's not, you know, um, so... So Yom Kippur became the priority. And when we were doing the research for Yom Kippur, we recognized there are a lot of differences between how the French Moroccans do it and the Spanish Moroccans do it, so much so that we felt it necessitated two different books. Um, not, not And also because in the Sidur, the weekday and Shabbat Sidur, you know, it's kind of, I would say it's okay if you have to flip back and forth here and there for different things. But when you're on when Yom Kippur, you know, you're in shul the whole day. No one really wants to have to get lost and and find their place and and, and flip back and forth. So there was also that extra uh, emphasis on you know let's make this as simple and easy as possible for people to follow. Um, you know, sort of that you can pray it from like you know page one to the end without complication. Um, so in order to do that, um, we had to make two different versions of the book. So we have a French Moroccan edition called the Rabibo edition. And we have a, a Spanish Moroccan edition called the Ozil edition. Um, Ozil being that my family, um, greater the greater Ozil family sponsored that edition. Um, some of the big differences between them, I would say, is you know Lecha Eli, which everybody's familiar with, is which you say um, right at the beginning of Yom Kippur. Um, the Spanish Moroccans say it at the end of our beat. They say it afterward. Um, uh, the um, there are you know it's a whole big machloket and and controversy about the pew team that were implemented um, in the middle of Pesuk of the Zimra um, and, and and for some reason it's a, it could be a whole different episode about why the why uh, 
how the Spanish Moroccans decided at some point that those few teams should not be in the middle of Pasuk de Zimra, even though during other times of the year, they do interrupt Pasuk de Zimra with Piyu team. Um, on Yom Kippur, they don't. And so a lot of those Piyu team are in a different place. Um, and the French Moroccans maintain those Piyu team. There's there's Piyu team that introduce Baruch Shemar. There's Piyu team, um, um, you know, at the uh, at Nishmat and, and whatnot. So uh, there's also you know, more tehillim that are said uh, by by the French Moroccans on, on Shabbat morning. So there, those are some of the specific differences. And um, we made two different books to accommodate those, the, the, the two different communities. Um, Slichot was was a project, it was actually a really nice project that that we did um, uh, in uh, with the same idea, you know, uh, Moroccan Nusach incorporating some of the, you know, all the, the Spanish and French stuff, with, uh, French Moroccan stuff where there there might be some differences you have, you have everything included and you have the translation, you have the commentary. And this is also another unique project where there's nothing like this in the Moroccan world. Um, the Moroccan Sidur, the Sidurum world, you just, uh, if you don't have a, uh, if, if, if you have uh, any, any one of these uh, Sidurum or Mahzurum, you have it only in Hebrew. So, uh, making it accessible for people to to better understand what they're doing. You know, we're we're getting up every morning super early or really late at night, and and we're we're saying slichot, and it, it's it's um, also slichot in particular is is a, a prayer service where there's a lot of inter um, there's there's a lot of exchange between the hazan and the kahila, right? It goes a lot of there's a lot of back and forth, and you have to know what you're saying when you're saying it. So that's another thing that we did in the sidur is that we have bold, um, and we we you know we have instructions that say like the kahila says this or the hazan says that, so you know when to jump in and not jump in if you don't exactly know where where, where what you're supposed to say. It's all in there, um, but also the translation, the commentary give you insight. Um, into the meaning behind what you're actually saying when when you're you're you're, you know, you're praying the service. Um, okay, and uh, the the slicha, So just in general, do they how how do they differ uh, very much from the standard idut mizrach slichas or there's there are they sim are they more similar? Can't, you can't get away from the standard before idut mizrach. <laughs> Did I say standard um, again? I didn't mean to. Look yeah. at that. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm not offended by it. I just I find it interesting that it becomes like a default way of thinking it's, that it gives rough a standard. I don't know. I wonder if it's because I'm just thinking aloud here on the podcast live. Like I wonder if it's because Ashkenazi went up like it's you're used to seeing a Dutton's rock or hearing about that. I don't know if it's because the Syrians, you know, being on the East Coast, a lot of Syrians, but there's a lot of Moroccans too in person others. I, I don't know if I, I it's, right. it's, it is interesting. I think but I think I don't only speak for myself. I think when most Ashkenazim <laughs> Think of like Svardim, Svardi. They think of like a Dut Mizrach as the Nusa. <laughs> Interesting, I, I, as we've said, that's not well, the case. But uh, apologies well, certainly for here. saying that again. Yes, yeah, so certainly here in, in Israel, because we are in the Mizrach, um, it, it, it's thought of as a standard. Um, um, you know, there, there's. I was actually talking to somebody recently who's looking to buy um, a Sidur for their Kehila. Uh, sorry, a Machzor for Yom Kippur for their Kehila, which is a new Kehila they started up. And they weren't familiar with the differences between the Dut Mizrach and Moroccan. And they said, well, we looked, we looked at two, you know, uh, a Dut Mizrach version, and we looked at a Moroccan Sidur, and we, we saw there are certain PU team that are in um, the Moroccan version that are not in Dut Mizrach. And I said, did you look into the tefillot themselves, right? There's actually differences in the, in the way that they're said. Like, you know, the, um, um, the Racham Anaz, um, some of them are in different order. Um, uh, another example would be, you know, the Elokeinu Shabbat Um They have the Dumizrach has ones that Moroccans don't have, and vice versa. And even even the way they they have them laid out, it's in a bit of a different order. Um, another, uh, I would say, standard one that people might be more familiar with is is the the song Anenu, right? Anenu Elohe Abraham Anenu. So that youth, um, the Moroccans say. Um, Avra, uh, Elohe Avraham Anenu, and then they say um, Anenu Haonev Be'et Ratzon Anenu, and then they go to Yitzchak, Ufachad Yitzchak, and then Anenu Haonev Be'et Sarah, and then they go to Yaakov. Um, by the Duke Mizrach, they do, they do the Avot first. So they do Anenu Elohe Avraham, and then they do Ufachad Yitzchak, and then they do Avir Yaakov, and then they do Haonev Be'et Ratzon, Haonev Be'et Sarah. 
So even within the putin themselves, they're, they're all jumbled up. There, there's a difference in, in the order. And that's just one example. It, it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's in every piyut, but I would say maybe the majority of piyutim, things are in different order, or there's one or two things that are added by the Dumizrach that are not in Moroccans. And so, you know, unless you're really familiar with what you're doing, you know, you could easily get tripped up or get lost um, if you're in a Dumizrach slichot uh, and you're a Moroccan or vice versa. So, um, essentially, these these sudurim then, these, well, not only sudurim, machzurim, slichas, kinnis, etc., all these works, they're meant for Moroccans, whether Spanish Moroccan, French Moroccan, essentially, is what you're, is what you're yeah. obviously gearing them for. <clears throat> Yeah, um, yeah. It, there, there has to be some some uh, boundaries, right? Because you also, you know, I, there's a lot of, you know, uh, Algerians and Tunisians. Most of them went to France, and they also their 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 nusach is much closer to what I'm familiar with, with with what they did in Morocco. But they also have their own their their nuances. Um, so the boundaries of my project so far, uh, up till now, is that. We're, you know, we're making Sidurim and Maxorim prayer books for the communities that were in Morocco. There's enough differences within Morocco itself that it's challenging enough just to keep keep everything intact within the Moroccan Nusa to call to actually call it a Moroccan Nusa, which some will debate doesn't exist. That, as I mentioned earlier, that it, it depended on where you were in Morocco. Um, so that that itself is is uh, is hard to be inclusive and to and to be precise. Um, uh, and, and, and so the, the books that we're focusing on are just Moroccan Sephardic. Actually, with the Tisha B'Av book, the Sidur that we came out with recently, which uh, came out this year, called Rachel Mivaka, um, that was the first uh, publication that we have uh, put out that is inclusive of Edut of Mizrach as well, because we, you know, uh, there is no other alternative in the Sephardic world, Bichlal, uh, for Tisha B'Av with translation and commentary. So we, you know, uh, we widened the market, we widened the scope of the project for, for Tisha B'Av to be inclusive of Edut Mizrach customs um, so that any Sephardi could pick up um, our our uh, our Sidur for Tisha B'Av and use it on, and, and, and find what they need. I just I just opened it by the way. Just mentioned one difference between an edut mizrach siddur. I'm not sure what the nusach. This probably has to do with the kabbalistic influence you were mentioning before. But at, at least to an Ashkenazi guy like myself, always open up a Sephardi siddur. You always see the shem Hashem always has like the adnos mm-hmm. that hey, yours does not have that. It just has Hashem the same right. yud kevavke the same right. thing that a regular Ashkenaz siddur has it. Right. So yeah, the 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 the, the um, edut mizrach uh, the makdid on. On putting in the Shem Hashem with the Shem Adanut inside the second hay of the of the Shem uh, of the of of, um, of the Shem Hashem, but um, but also you'll find that a lot of um, Sephardic Sidurim, the Mizrach Sidurim specifically, is is a lot of Kavanot uh, in smaller fonts, and um, again, that's like you said, it's it's the it's the Kabbalistic influence, um, whereas. Uh, it wasn't as prominent in Morocco. Again, you know, save you know the influence of of the Bukhatsera family and all the the Kabbalistic influence that they had, um, and especially that you're finding in Marrakesh or whatever. That that certainly um, incorporated a lot of Kabbalah and a lot of Kabbalah. But for the most part, you'll you know, the Moroccan uh, liturgy. Um, was not inclusive of all the, uh, the different um, kavanot uh, in there. It wasn't in the Livorno Sidur, right? So it wasn't really it wasn't really something that was adapted an, until later on. Um, and and then you had you know many Moroccan communities that never adapted to it. Right. Okay. So um, I'm going to link to the website on the Derech, which, by the way, is spelled on the Derech, like the academic uh, people are familiar with the D E R E K H. So O N T H E D E R E K H dot com, but Derech is being K H on C H. People may be familiar with. I'll yeah. link to that where you can uh, purchase them there. Are they available also in local uh, bookstores, farm stores? Or that's the best way to order? Yeah. No, no. I mean, there are there are um, bookstores throughout the, the states that have them. Um, you know, the, the best way is probably online, just because uh, you know we'll we'll get it out to you directly. And I, you know, uh, it depends on where you live. Um, but uh, yeah, you you're mentioning the 
on the derivatives with a KH, we, you know, we could probably spend a whole half an hour talking about uh, um, transliteration methodology and style. And, and uh, that was another thing that we spent a lot of time thinking about um, because there's a tremendous amount of transliteration that goes on within the, the translation of the Sidur. Um, and, uh, and again, we wanted to make the, uh, we wanted to make you know, user friendliness um, was was uh, you know the highest of priority for us. So in terms of how we translated and and uh, and whatnot and and how we transliterated all that you know a lot of thought was put into all that. So uh, yeah, in terms of, of of buying the books on the derek dot com um, and um, and uh, you know you get the book within uh, within a few days. Yes, I'll I'll include that link in the show's notes. Um, now on the website it has books in production, so I was going to ask about future projects, and it has their Master of Russia sure. channel, which which was noticeably absent from from what we were talking about. So clearly that's one, and then also yeah. you're working on a Master for Sukkot. So, um, how soon do you expect those, and what has it been like working on those? Right. those and any others that you're working on? Yeah, so the, these projects take a long time to to put together. Um, you know, there's a lot of 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 different um, different levels to it. Um, and you know we we don't want to rush through it because we want to make sure we get it right. Uh, last thing we want to do is is you know rush and and then have mistakes and then um, no one wants to pray from a sidur that that is incorrect or has has uh, you know has mistakes in it. So um, it's it's taken us in the past a long time you know several years to come up with different books. Um, we've been able to to speed that up a little bit. Um, so our next major project is Rosh Hashanah. We want to have the Yom, Yamim Norim set of Rosh, Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah in place. Um, and like you said, Sukkot is also on the docket to come out. We want to get all the uh, um, all the Shalosh Regalim Maksarim out as well. And um, we're also looking at doing smaller projects. You know, um, <clears throat> you know, it's not in, really clear what the priority is in terms of which ones we're going to do first, but. We're looking to do smaller things, um, you know, ventures and um, uh, smaller pamphlets and stuff like that, that we can get out to shuls, you know, <clears throat> things like just a little pamphlet for Brit Mila so that, you know, you, you have something, you don't have to go looking through a sidur to when there's a Brit Mila in the shul, you can just take out a pamphlet of Brit Mila and you can use it. So things like that, we're, we're, we're also um, we're working on as well. Okay, great. So uh, I'll link to the to the uh, to all of them in the show's notes if anyone's interested in uh, purchasing and they can check out more and learn more about it in the show's notes and thank you sammy for joining me to talk about on the derech and uh, what you've been doing it's been a pleasure Nahi. thank you so much for having me on your show and uh, uh yeah i'm just uh, honored to be part of it thank you